We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. When I think of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave you... Oh, hello. Um, sorry, I didn't see you. And there, there are so many of you. Um, I, I was just reading a letter I'm writing to the Christians in Ephesus. Hadn't expected visitors in prison, but it's so good to see you. And there, wow, there are a lot of you. Uh, question? How did I end up in prison? Ha! Huh. Well, that's a long story, and, but I've got time. Um, I was working over in Macedonia and Achaia in, in Asia a bit, but you know, I had the impression that I needed to go to Rome, the capital of the empire. J just imagine if we had a big group of Christians, followers of the Lord in Rome. Imagine if the emperor himself became a follower of Jesus. And so that's my heart's desire, but I wanted to go back to Jerusalem one last time. Well, we started to sail back. We paused at Ephesus. Actually, I, I sent someone on ahead and the whole church from Ephesus came out to see me, to wish me well. And I, I just love the people of that church. I, over the time, I've been there probably three years all up. And uh, I must admit, there was some weeping on the beach while we're waiting for the tide to come in for the boat. But uh, we just said our farewells. They knew, I knew, I'd probably never be back. Trophimus and Luke are with me. Trophimus is a Gentile from Ephesus. He's going to do big things for the Lord, I'm sure. Now, now Luke, the writer, I, I, I hope you've actually read his scroll on the story of Jesus. It is so good. And it's such a good reminder of what Jesus did of his life. And, you know, Luke is a writer. He's always got a bit of papyrus out with a bit of a charcoal -y pen kind of thing and he's writing notes and then he just slips it into his pocket or into his bag and might even write our story one day. Who knows? Anyway, we sailed from Ephesus and got to the island of Cos and the next day we headed off towards Rhodes. Yeah, I, I was really keen to get to Rhodes. You know, I, I felt a bit like a tourist because I, I knew part of the story. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but the Colossus of Rhodes is there the biggest statue in the world. Now, 300 years ago, there was war in the area and the armies of Rhodes defeated their enemy, whoever that was. And so in their victory, they said, let's build a huge statue to the sun god, Helios, 33 metres high. That is huge. I mean, how do you measure it? Um, if there were 20 of me standing on my shoulders, that would be about how high it would be. Now, I'm not been to Rhodes, but I knew the story behind it. And I called to Luke and Trophimus and said, hey, you've got to watch this. You, you, you watch out for this statue. It's huge. And as we were getting closer to Rhodes, I, I could see them just, you know, looking up there and saying, well, I can't see it yet. I can't see it yet. I, I, I had to smile to myself because I knew the secret. I knew the secret. And finally... We come get closer to the harbour and they're saying, well, where, where is it? Paul, where is it? Is it behind the hill? And I'm saying, just, just keep watching, just keep watching. It's over that way. And we finally sailed into the harbour and I said, it's not up there, it's down there. You see, 50 years after it was built, an earthquake came and it was flattened. The only thing still sticking up was the legs up to the knees. And there it was, lying on the ground, grass growing over it. It was amazing. And it, to me, is a reminder that there is only one true God. Yeah, write that down, Luke. There is only one true God. All other gods are worthless. And we know that, don't we? Anyway, we sailed from there to Tyre and spent a week with the believers there. Now, they did raise an issue. Um, we had three or four people who had the gift of prophecy in the church in Tyre, and each one of them came up to me and said, you should not go to Jerusalem. Now, they were earnest. They were earnest. And yet at the same time, I was earnest in that I should go to Jerusalem. I I'm, wasn't quite sure what to do that, but I bid farewell to them. And again, there were tears. Um, you know, 
we who are the followers of the Lord, we are close together. It's a wonderful thing. We sailed down to Ptolemaeus and uh, it was only for a day there with the believers. And then we went to Caesarea. We sailed down there, getting close to Jerusalem now. I mean, it's walking distance from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Well, three days walking distance, but stayed at the home of Philip. I, I, I don't know if you know Philip's stories, but um, he was one of the 12 deacons that were chosen to care for the church. And uh, while there, he told me this story of how the Lord had taken him out almost into the wilderness to meet someone. And he discovered when he got there, it was a, an Ethiopian, born in Ethiopia, had become a Jew and had come to the temple to worship the Lord. And he was in his chariot. Um, and, and I should tell you that uh, Philip discovered that he was actually the treasurer to the queen in Ethiopia. Anyway, he's walking alongside the chariot and uh, the Ethiopian is reading, you'd never guess what, Isaiah 53, the prophecies of Jesus. And, and so Philip interrupted and said, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian said, well, how can I if someone doesn't tell me? And so he climbed up on the chariot and he began to explain Jesus from Isaiah 53. You need to check that out sometimes. It is really an amazing prophecy. And as they were talking, he said, well, look, how do I follow this Jesus? And Philip talked about baptism. He said, well, why can't I be baptized? Well, there's no reason why you can't, he said. And happened to be a lake there, which was rather handy. So went down into the lake. He was baptized. And then Philip went his way. The Ethiopian went his way. What an amazing... Boy, I hope Luke gets that story down too. But while we were there, Agabus the prophet did the strangest thing. He came to visit and, you know, he took a hold of my belt and he tied my hands and my feet with it. And then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and be turned over to the Gentiles. Whoa. What a prophecy that was. And, you know, all the people there, they, they started begging me, say, Paul, don't go. Don't go any further. Um, some of them were crying. They, they were all in despair, thinking that something bad was going to happen. And, and you know what? I still had the sense I needed to go to Jerusalem. So I said to them, look, why all this weeping? Why all this weeping? I, I'm ready to go to prison even to die for Jesus. Look, I've learned that our God is bigger than the broken gods of this world. And I've learned that through everything, God is with us. And you know, I, they, they did give up, but I could see they weren't convinced. And they just said, well, the Lord's will be done. Now, you may wonder why I didn't actually heed the warning. But you know, I'd been impressed by God that I would be going to Rome, whatever happened. I, I now knew that there'd be trouble in Jerusalem, didn't know what it was, but I also knew that I'd been through a lot of things already and, and I couldn't imagine them being worse than what I'd already been through. And the other thing I knew was that through it all, God was with me, through it all. Look, I, I did wonder about the welcome I'd receive in Jerusalem uh, from the Christians, because I'd been away quite some time and I just wondered, would they still know me? Would they still want me as part of their group? But you know, it was a warm welcome. The leaders wanted me to share about my work and I was glad to tell of the many Gentiles who become followers of the Lord and Trophimus was one of those and he told some other stories as well. There are lots following Jesus and there was rejoicing. There was praise in the group. And, and then I discovered they told me of the thousands. They said it was thousands of Jews in Jerusalem who believed. And we just praised God together. It was a good day. And, and then they raised with me a, a problem they wanted me to work on. So they said that um, there was a rumor going around that I was teaching Gentiles to turn their backs on the law of Moses. 
Now, that's not true. I mean, the five books of Moses are important. I mean, this is where you find the Ten Commandments. I was not doing that. But anyway, that's what the story was. And they suggested that there were four people completing their temple vows and I should go and support them, um, go with them to the temple for the purification ceremony, uh, pay for their ceremonial head shaving, and all that I did. It was kind of a seven day process and they were almost done. And when some Jews from Asia came into the temple and they recognized me, they recognized me. I'd actually had trouble with them in one of the cities in Asia. And they began yelling. And they were saying, this man preaches against our faith. Not only that, he speaks against the temple and he defiles the temple with Gentiles. Gentiles in the temple? Now, Trophimus was with me, certainly traveling with me, and he was in Jerusalem, but I, I didn't bring him into the temple. I would never have done that. That was against the law. Anyway, they just grabbed me, they dragged me out of the temple, they threw me to the ground, they punched me, they kicked me. I felt some stones hit me, and I just trying to protect myself. I, I, it's all I could do. I, I thought this was the moment I was going to die. This was the moment when I began to wonder if I shouldn't have listened to all the warnings. But you know, a sense of peace came over me. God was with me. I knew that. Live or die, I trusted him. See, through it all, God has been with me. Mind you, I was pretty pleased when Claudius Lysias, the Roman commander, showed up and all of a sudden there were Roman soldiers running through the crowd and they stopped the beating, they pulled me to my feet, they wrapped chains around my wrists and uh, asked the crowd what it was all about. <laughs> Nobody made any sense, there was too much shouting, too much yelling, they couldn't hear what it was about. So Lysias just ordered me to be taken to the fortress and uh, when we got there, to the steps of the fortress, the crowd suddenly surged forward and, and it was so packed that they couldn't move me. So the soldiers picked me up, put me on their shoulders. And here I am chained on their shoulders like a bag of wheat as they took me up the steps. They, they were protecting me. And I'm glad they did because the crowd was yelling, kill him, kill him, kill him. When we were to the door of the fortress, I said to Claudius Lysias, can I speak to you? And he was a bit surprised that I could speak Greek, it seems. He thought I was the Egyptian who led a rebellion against the Jews, against the Romans, a few years back. Um, I, I don't know if you the story, but the Egyptian had 4,000 men who joined him in a rebellion against Rome. They called themselves the Sicarii or the Assassins. And at one time, he said, I'm going to go on to... Mount of Olives, and when I speak the word, the city walls of Jerusalem are going to fall. And then they thought, we'll go in and take Jerusalem back from the Romans. Well, he certainly turned up on that day, and the 4,000 were with him, and he spoke the word. Uh, guess what? The walls didn't fall down. The soldiers came out, and several hundred were killed, and several hundred more were put into prison, but the Egyptian escaped. I told the commander that I was a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but I said to him, please let me talk to them. And he agreed and he signaled to the crowd to be quiet. And I spoke them into Aramaic, their language, the language we used in Jerusalem. And I said, brothers and esteemed fathers, listen to me as I offer my defense. And they became even more quiet. I, I think they were surprised that I spoke Aramaic. And so I told them, look, I'm a Jew. I was born in Tarsus in Cilicia. I was educated in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. And it was true, I'd studied under Gamaliel. But he was such a revered rabbi among the Jews that that would signal to them that I understood the Jewish law, the Jewish teaching. I'd been well trained in it. And so I told them, I persecuted Christians. I hounded them to death. Uh, you know, as I was saying this, I had this flashback 
to the day Stephen was stoned. And I just watched. I was holding the robes of the men who were stoning them. How sad was that? Anyway, I went on and I told them, you know, I went about arresting men and women all over the place, followers of Jesus. And I was asked to go to Damascus to bring the Christians back to Jerusalem in chains so they could be perhaps executed, perhaps they could be imprisoned. I had no idea what. But you've probably heard my story from that experience, going down the Damascus road and all of a sudden there was this light and there was this voice. Why are you persecuting me, Paul? And I said, who are you? And the voice said, Jesus, the one you're persecuting. This was my meeting with Jesus, the light of the world, the one who changed my life. You know, meeting Jesus changes lives. <laughs> it certainly changed mine. And I, I told the people, look, God said I was not to stay in Jerusalem. You know, I wanted to stay in Jerusalem. I, I had all the arguments I could think of with God. You know, I know these people well. I know how they think. I, I could convince them. I mean, I've gone from being the bad boy to being your follower. Surely that would have some impact on the people. But God was definite. God was definite. And I said to the people there, the crowd, the Lord said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Soon as I said that word Gentiles, the crowd started shouting again, roaring. And in fact, so much so that the commander ordered me into the fortress. And then he ordered me to be whipped until I confessed to my crimes. Um, seems a little problem with that logic. You know, I'm not sure how that works if you haven't committed any crimes. But anyway, that's what was ordered. And they ripped the robe off my back. They chained me ready to be beaten on the back and uh, tied me down, just getting ready to lash me. And that was the point where I said to the officer, uh, excuse me, um, is this legal? What do you mean, is it legal? Is it legal to rip a whip a Roman citizen without a trial? He actually disappeared pretty quickly. And then Claudius Lysias, the commander, was soon there. And he asked, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I certainly am. Well, I am too. He said, it cost me a pretty penny. Well, actually, I was born a Roman citizen. I told him. They quickly gave back my robe, untied me and quietly left the room. You know, we have a great God. I, I can only praise him. I've seen the other gods that humans make and create. The Colossus, remember him? Nothing compared to our God. And God is with us, whatever is happening. Through it all, he is with us. Next morning, Commander Lysias took me to a meeting with the Jewish High Council. I, I think he was just trying to sort this thing out. Not, not really understanding, as a Roman, what this political situation was, this religion situation was. And so I began by saying, Brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. A voice came from the back, said, Hit him! I got a slap in the mouth. Now, I was a bit angry at this, and I said, God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. Why break the law ordering me struck like that? And somebody said, do you dare insult God's high priest? Oh, I, I, I apologise. I mean, Scripture says, do not speak ill of your leaders. I, I felt I needed a plan B for this situation because I, I knew it was going to go nowhere. So here was a group of leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees. So I, I said this and I confess I knew it was going to cause a problem. But this is what I said. Brothers, I am a Pharisee and I'm on trial. My hope is in the resurrection of the dead. And that's true. My hope is in the resurrection of the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. My hope is in a resurrection from the dead. But the room exploded with noise. 
You, you see, there were Pharisees there and some were pointing at me and saying, that man is not guilty of anything. But the Sadducees, they were trying to do me a damage, pull me down, rip me up or something, because you see, Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. Now, the soldiers just came, grabbed me to protect me and took me back to prison. You know, the best thing happened that night. The really best thing. The Lord appeared to me. <laughs> wow. The Lord appeared to me. And he had a message. You must preach the good news in Rome. Wow. I was going to preach the good news in Rome. I heard it straight from his mouth. It's going to happen. You know, it's a delight. It's a delight to know what God's plan is for your life. He hadn't finished with me. Not yet. You know, and what anyone was going to try to do, I was going to Rome. I was assured of that. My adventure with God was not over. And that's exciting. Through it all, God has been with me. Next day, there was a little, uh, a little hiccup. My nephew, my sister's son, uh, who lives in Jerusalem, he, he came to visit. Not just to visit as my nephew, but with a warning. He'd heard that there were 40 men who said they wouldn't eat or drink until they killed me. But they'd actually gone to the leading priests and said, tell Lysias to bring Paul back and we will wait on the way and we will kill him before he gets to you. Now, didn't quite know what to do, but I, I called across a Roman soldier and said to him, look, my nephew has a message for Claudius Lysias. Would you, would you take him to him? Um, I didn't hear, about, hear back what was happening, but later that night I was ordered to grab my things uh, and taken out into the courtyard. There were a couple of hundred soldiers, a couple of hundred spearmen, um, 70 or so mounted troops, and a horse for me. <laughs> I said to Lysias, um, I don't do horses. And Lysias simply said, well, you do now. And then I looked at how I was dressed in robes and thought, how do you ride a horse dressed like this? Anyway, <laughs> managed. We left about nine o'clock that night um, and we rode through the night 60 kilometres to the fort in Antipatris. And then the next morning, the soldiers marched back and uh, we rode on another 40 kilometres to Caesarea. And yes, if you want to know, I fell off twice. OK, well, well, three times if you count the time I fell off trying to get on. And when I get there, I was in agony. I could barely walk. And I wondered if it would have been easier to die in Jerusalem than be here in this pain. Anyway, Claudius Lysias had written a letter to uh, Governor Felix and I was taken to meet with him. And did I tell you I could barely walk? Anyway, he merely wanted to know where I was from and I told him Tarsus in Cilicia. I, I think it was about jurisdiction. Did he have jurisdiction over me? I think that's what that was about. And he told me that when the accusers came from Jerusalem, he would make a judgment on my future. So here I am, just waiting, just waiting to see what happens next. Just waiting for God's timing, I guess. He, he knows what's best for me. I trust him. And it's been, well, it must be 10 days since I left Jerusalem and I, uh, well, I mustn't laugh, but it's hard not to. There must be 40 very hungry, thirsty men back in Jerusalem. I wonder how they're faring. So, look, that's a long answer to how come I'm in prison. I'm on an adventure with God and it's brought me here. But two things I've learned, two things. First, there is only one true God. I saw the fallen sun god Helios on roads, and that's a lesson for all of us. There is no God like our living God. And the second thing is through it all, whatever it is, God is with us. 
whether it's in the lockup like me, or perhaps it's people in a lockdown, or something much more challenging. Through it all, God is with us. God is with us. Just before you go, let me share with you a benediction that uh, actually writing to the church in Ephesus. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>